Generative AI is the technology behind the wave of new online tools used by millions around the world. Some can answer queries on a huge range of topics in conversational language. Others can generate realistic-looking photographs from short text prompts. As the technology is ever more widely deployed, what are its current strengths and its weaknesses? The Economist science editor Alok Jha is joined by deputy editor Tom Standage, science correspondent Abby Bertix, and global business and economics correspondent Arjun Romani to discuss this new era of AI. Tom, The Economist has written about AI many, many times in its various forms over the years. What's changed since the last time we were really interested in it that's made it much better, made AI much better than perhaps it used to be? What happened in 2017 was that some researchers at Google came up with a better attention mechanism called the transformer. And that's what the T in GPT stands for. Um, and so essentially that made um, these systems a lot better. They could sort of come up with more longer pieces of coherent output, whether that's text or computer code or whatever. So there was a technical breakthrough and, um, and that took a while to ripple uh, through the community. So that's one of the things that changed. But the other thing that changed is that this technology became much more visible. Of course, what happened last year is that a much more capable model, GPT 3.5, was launched as chat GPT, literally as a chatbot, which you know anyone could sign up for. And once you got to the front of the waiting list, you could go and talk to it. And you know, you'll have heard these numbers that 100 million people tried it within the first two months. And that's you know, reckoned to be the fastest adoption of a consumer technology in history. So the thing that really changed is that suddenly there was a way that anyone could use this technology and they came up with all sorts of amazing uses for it and asked it to do all sorts of extraordinary things. And that was what really put it on the map. I think one of the huge strengths of these large language models is that they're able to kind of crunch and churn through such like scads of unlabeled data. So normally, like in the past with AI, you always needed like your thing and a label. So that required humans to kind of go through and label them. But these large language models, you just, you chuck in the internet and you get out of it a blurry picture that is basically taken of hundreds of billions of words. Um, and it, it honestly just seems to do well. I think a lot of people are still kind of baffled why, why it's doing so well at so many tasks. Like it, it generates convincing text. Um, it's very good at pattern matching. Style transfer is one of the other things. Like you ask it to like, oh, write a love letter in the style of a pirate from the 14th century that has an Irish accent, but is from like the Bahamas. And then it's also pretty good at passing um, standardized tests, it seems. Like it, it passed the US medical licensing exam. It's passed some legal tests. Um, basically very good at kind of text things. At the moment, I think, uh, you know, the, one of the big opportunities is writing code. The great thing about writing code with these systems, and, and I do still write some code, um, is that uh, if, the, if the code is slightly wrong, you find out straight away because, uh, you know, either the interpreter or the compiler chokes on it um, or the output of the code isn't quite what you were expecting. So you have this very tight feedback loop. Um, and uh, if it's slightly wrong, you find out you find out pretty quickly. In terms of weaknesses, I, I think one of them is the lack of transparency. Like it, it's kind of a black box. We you can have access to kind of what's going inside the attention weights, what those values are, but they don't mean a lot to us. Um, there's over a hundred billion of these weights, and that's very very complex and hard for us to understand and what they're doing. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think the main weakness is that it's such a complex system and we don't really understand it fully. If your job is to find out new facts, that's actually not something that these systems are, are really in a good position to do. And I was talking to people um, within the, uh, the Foreign Office, the British government, the other day, and also they were saying, what's the impact of this? And I was saying, look, our job, whether we work in government or the intelligence services or journalism, is to find new facts. And, um, and they've got to be right. <laughs> You've got to, you, you really don't want to just take any old stuff coming out of one of these systems. So if the, if the accuracy matters, then these systems are, you know, maybe not so great. The reliability of the models need to be improved, I think, before, uh, you know, they start automating huge amounts of processes and businesses. Um, but I, I mean, there's a huge amount of uh, economic activity, I think, that'll get affected by this. I mean, and the paper put out by uh, some economists at OpenAI that said that, you know, uh, around 20% of the U.S. workforce 
uh, could have around 50% of their tasks uh, affected by, by generative AI in the next few years, right? So a lot of tasks that we do on a day-to-day -day basis um, could be helped by these models over, over the long term. But there's some interesting, uh, you know, research in the economics of innovation that talks about how if you want to get uh, what we called uh, an intelligence explosion, or if you want to get, uh, you know, exponentially increasing rates of economic growth um, in any given uh, domain, uh, you need to automate the entire process. If you've only automated, you know, 90% of it or 99% of it, uh, that doesn't get you uh, nearly the same the, the same effect um, because the the slowest part of the process, which is maybe probably the human, acts as what's called a rate determining step. Um, so we we'll, we'll end up slowing things down. So I think that's probably uh, you know what is likely to happen in my mind, where you know we use AIs to help us uh, with research, which frankly we are already doing, um, but. It, it still is not able to get 100% of the way there. So ultimately, the pace of progress continues um, as, as it has been. So, so they, they, they would have become super intelligent and turned us into paperclips if it wasn't for those pesky humans getting in the way of them making them more intelligent. This is an excerpt from a 45-minute discussion about the risks and opportunities of AI. Economist subscribers can watch the exclusive event in full by clicking on the link.